Hello, and welcome to Reading for the Love of It Presents. I'm your host, Erica Townsend, and I am the Executive Administrator with the EYS Reading Association and the conference organizer of Reading for the Love of It. We have a really fun double feature for you today. It's going to be great for both teachers and students alike. My guests include Ruth Owey and Ted Staunton. Please note that you are joining us in listen-only mode. We cannot see or hear you, but you should have no difficulty in watching the presentation. Ruth Owey is the illustrator of over 60 books, 22 of which she is also the author. Her latest is Choose Kindness, published by Scholastic Canada, and Blanket, coming out August 2nd with Groundwood Books. Most recent author illustrated books include Scribble, No Help Wanted, and the Fox and the Squirrel series, all published by Scholastic Canada. Ruth is a graduate of the Ontario College of Arts and lives in Toronto, Canada. Her books have been published in Korea, China, the United States, Belgium, Turkey, Holland, Australia, and translated into Spanish and Hebrew. You can visit with Ruth at www.ruthoe.com. Ted Staunton wrote his first story as a class assignment at university. He barely handed it in on time, but he's glad that he did. It became the picture book, Puddle Man. Now the award-winning author of over 40 books, writes everything from YA and mid-grade novels, including titles, in the popular Seven series, to high lows, nonfiction, early chapter books, and of course, picture books. He's getting better at handing things in on time as well. His YA novel, Who I'm Not, won the 2014 CCBC John Spray Mystery Award. Ted's work has also been nominated for Silver Birch, Red Maple, Hackmatack, Arthur Ellis, and BC Stellar Awards, and many of his books are on the CCBC Our Choice lists. Trained as a teacher, Ted is a speaker, performer, and workshop leader in schools, libraries, and venues across Canada. As well, he teaches the writing children's fiction courses at George Brown College. He has also traveled to Ethiopia several times to work with English language writers and editors there. When he's not writing, Ted plays in the Maple Leaf Champions Jug Band. He always brings his guitar and banjo to school presentations, too. He enjoys running, reading, writing, and listening to music. Born young, he is now older. Ted and his family live in Port Hope, Ontario. I'm delighted to introduce you to today's presenters, Ruth Owey and Ted Staunton. Hi, my name is Ruth Owey, and I'm the illustrator of Ted Staunton's picture book, Friends for Real. And I'm also a writer and illustrator of the Fox and Squirrel series and picture books like Scribble. And my latest book, which is Choose Kindness, and they're all published by Scholastic Canada. When illustrating another author's manuscript, it's always a thrill getting the chance to discover their world, meet their characters, and explore how my illustrations could play a part in it all. My own stories include a fiercely independent perfectionist who finds out that it's okay to ask for help when you need it, and that teamwork can save the day. The Fox and Squirrel series has two characters who are quite different, but find enough in common to get along. While that series celebrates similarities, Scribble celebrates our differences and how we can use them together to make wonderful things happen. With differences and similarities, Choose Kindness is about how one act of kindness can cause a ripple effect. The title could have been Be Kind, but we chose choose kindness, since we all have the choice to be kind or not. 
In my sessions, I like to share my first rough sketches and penciled words in all their scribbly messiness. My hope is that when audiences see them, they realize that the shiny book they see in a store or library is far from what it looked like in the very beginning. One of my favorite things to do is engaging young readers through stories and pictures to encourage their own story making. Using call and response interactive drawing demos, I share how I use basic shapes to create characters and emotions, asking the audience for suggestions on what I could draw. Who would they want to star in their story? The audience has paper and something to draw with so that they can draw their own ideas and draw along. Imaginations are launched. Creativity and innovation is encouraged. With ideas from the audience, we explore how creating backgrounds can enrich a story. A park, a forest, by the beach, outer space. The story potential is limitless. What could happen next? What is a problem the character could face and how could it be solved? Taking a team approach, older audiences get to experience live the process of writing and illustrating a story. Younger ones watch a story that they help create come to life. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you had fun. Thanks for supporting Reading for the Love of It. Hi everybody, welcome to this Reading for the Love of It video. My name is Ted Staunton. As you can see, I've got my Read More Books t-shirt on uh, because not only do I love to read books, as many of you know, I like to write them as well. I've written a lot of books in a lot of different forms. Of all the stories I've written, the ones that posed the most interesting and sometimes uh, the most difficult challenges were the ones that went into picture books and graphic novels. At the same time, these two forms are the ones where kids are most often really enthusiastic about activating their own creativity. So in this video, I'm going to give you a peek behind the scenes at the writing of picture books and graphic novels and offer some simple suggestions about how you could adapt some of the, these techniques for the classroom. And then in her segment, my wonderful co-creator Ruth Ohi is going to give you a look at the illustration process. Now to show you how it all works, I'm going to use my two newest books from Scholastic Canada. Friends for Real, a picture book that is illustrated by Ruth, and the brand new graphic novel, The Good Fight, which is illustrated by my buddy Josh Rosen. The books, obviously, are very different, but the writing process was similar, and your students can use some of that process, and in fact, you can use these two books as story starters to spark writing projects that they can manage. So let's start with the main obvious thing that picture books and graphic novels have in common. They both have pictures to tell the story. Now that has a huge impact on how I write. Now, books like these always begin with me, with the story, just with words. Everything is written before a single line is drawn. But knowing there will be art, here's what I always keep in mind as I write. Never say the same thing twice. If the art can show it, don't tell it with the words too. Words and pictures are meant to complement each other in these books instead of repeating things. Let me give you two quick examples here. So in Friends for Real, we have a story about Emma. Emma has a best friend or best pet, a favorite stuffy named Squeezy. Now, here's where I introduce Squeezy. It's on this page right here. And the text is very simple. It says, here's Squeezy. And it says, Squeezy was puffy and perfectly huggable. Now, when I first wrote that, I actually had Squeezy was purple and perfectly huggable. But I don't need to say purple. Ruth is going to show that in the picture. Well, okay, Ruth made him green, but I didn't need to say the color because it would be there. So instead, I put in a tactile description instead that Squeezy is puffy. I also left out when the best time would be to hug Squeezy when you're in your jammies and sharing a story before bed. All of that can be left to the illustrator. Now, in a graphic novel, same kind of thing. The Good Fight is set in 1933 in Toronto, the depths of the Great Depression. Sid and his friends, Plug and Rosie, are poor kids living in the immigrant neighborhood of Kensington, a Jewish and Italian neighborhood. Um, and they're the subject of discrimination. Toronto was a very different place at that time. 
They're desperate to earn money for their families. So here's a bit where Sid is trying to help his family by selling newspapers on the street. He gets bullied, his newspapers are scattered, and as he tries to pick them up, a fairly well-dressed man comes by, picks up a paper, folds it up, and stuffs it inside his shoe to hide the hole in the sole. Sid doesn't know what to make of this. Now, I came up with that sequence, I wrote it, but we didn't need a single word to tell it because Josh could show the whole thing with art. That is a great thing to keep in mind because it makes it much, much stronger and a much cleaner delivery of the story. So here's another way to think of it. When you write a story with pictures, you have three ways to share it. By telling the story, one morning I walked outside, by showing it in pictures, and by dialogue, the things the characters say. What will you tell? What will you show? What will they say? Now, if you combine that with knowing some basics about the two different forms, you're ready to give this a try with students. So let's take a look at exactly how I do this. Then I'll give you a couple of suggestions about how you can use my stories as well. Now, of course, all stories uh, need an idea to get you going. For me, I get story ideas from all kinds of things in life. I'll show you where the idea for these two came from in a second. Kids, of course, often get their imagination stimulated by the stories that we read. That's why we enjoy them. And they want to write their own stories based on that. So do adults. That's what fan fiction is, really, isn't it? So here's a little bit of how I got started on Friends and how you might be able to use it. I got the idea for Friends For Real from this picture that was in Ruth's notebook. She showed it to me, and I immediately began to wonder who or what is on the end of this line. All you can see at the moment is Ruth's picture. Now, Ruth had some ideas for who or what was at the end of this line, but I didn't want to know. I wanted to imagine it for myself. This character became Emma. Who was at the end of the line? Well, I decided Squeezy would be at the end of the line. And in the story, Squeezy and Emma are going to lose each other. They go to the park, and while they're soaring to the clouds, Squeezy flies away. Now, the rest of my story is about how Emma decides that she has to find some new friends, and she has to learn some things about friendship. At the end of the story, spoiler alert, she and Squeezy are reunited. But there's another story that could be told. What adventures did Squeezy have while Emma was missing? Where did he land? Who else in the park did he meet? How does he end up where he does at the end? How did he feel during his adventure? All of those things are there to imagine. And when you start thinking about it, so many things could have occurred. So many things could have happened to Squeezy that the story could go on forever. But of course, then you never finish. Now, one thing that kids often ask is, how long should a story be? It's a great question, because I ask it all the time, especially for picture books. If you set a boundary for how long a story should be and how many ideas you need, kids are more comfortable in that, and it gives you a clear goal. So, if you know something about picture books, you can work that to your favor. So here's a couple of things. First of all, picture books are always 32 pages long. If you save three or four pages for title page and so on, that leaves you 28 pages or 14 sets of double page art and text like that. I know that all the time I'm writing. It's always in the back of my head. Now, when I first write a story for a picture book, it will simply look like this. But I know it can't be too long, so I aim for about five to 600 words. As I change my mind about the story and it gets better, I start to think about splitting it into those 14 sections. Now, how it will look will be up to Ruth and the editor and the book designer, but how can I pace out my story? So now I've started to put in page numbers. This is what I'll share with other people who are helping to create the book. Now, what, what goes on that page is up to them to decide, but this helps me work with the art. Now, Ruth reads that story and she begins to do some rough sketches. I get to see the rough sketches and sometimes that makes me change my mind about what I've written and I can go back and improve it, which is fantastic. But here's a little 
extra bit. When illustrators begin their artwork, if they know there are going to be 14 sections for them to draw, they often work with something called a storyboard. The storyboard lets them see all their artwork at once, make sure there's variety, and that every page will look different. This is a storyboard for my old picture book, Puddle Man, and these pictures are by Brenda Clark. Brenda didn't use a single one of these pictures, but they got her imagination going. She had choices to make, and this is how she did it. Now, I like to use storyboards when I'm writing with students. And they can be really, really effective at framing how much work you have to do. Now, I like to create books with students out of stories. And I tell them that we're going to need eight story pages in our books. Then I give everybody their own storyboard, just a sheet of paper split up into eight boxes. Now, each box on my storyboard is one page in the book instead of a double page spread. But this is how much we have to tell our story with words and pictures and dialogue. So, the other thing that makes, sorry, this is homemade. The other thing that makes this useful is that I can write my story out of order. When I imagine a story, I don't think in linear order. I may know the beginning, I may know the middle, or I just may know the ending, but I can write it down out of order. So I started thinking about what would happen to Squeezie, and here's what I came up with. I've got four ideas out of eight so far. And I started off like this. One day, Squeezie soared from Emma and thump. Stay sitting on my egg. I need to go get a worm, said the robin. So he's landed in a nest. I don't have to say that. I'll draw it. Squeezie sat still till whoosh, the wind blew, and off he's going to go. Now, what happens in the middle? I have no idea. I do know I want Squeezie and Emma to find each other again at the end. How could that happen? I thought, a dog. So I wrote the last page. Emma ran up with the dog. It was time for a hug. How could the dog help? That gave me the page before. Woof, said the dog. I know someone who smells just like you. I'll fetch her. Well, I don't know what's in the middle, but I know how much I have to tell. I can put in a couple of more things that will happen to Squeezy, and then they're back together. Now I have a rough copy of my story. Haven't drawn the pictures yet, but I've written it. If I want to, that can be turned into a book. Some construction paper, three sheets of photocopier paper. I like to use the legal size photocopier paper. Three sheets will give you extra pages for title page, copyright, and so on. And then you'll have eight pages of story with room for about the author at the end. Very much the way books are professionally created, using all these techniques and using a story to get your imaginations going. Okay, now how might this work with graphic novels? Well, same basic idea, storyboards again. But obviously graphic novels are longer. The Good Fight is, I think, 222 pages. And almost every page has multiple pictures. It took Josh over two years to do the artwork for this book. Now, I had, again, the character and the idea to get things rolling. The Good Fight actually began with an article I read about old-time pickpockets and the slang expressions that they had. And that led me to the Great Depression, Toronto, ethnic communities, and the riot at Christie Pitts. How I wrote it was all, again, about storyboards. Josh told me some cool things about graphics that you need to remember. First is that there are usually about six panels on every page of a graphic novel. So as I was writing, he told me, think in terms of panels and remember six per page. That'll pace the story. He also told me I should suggest what could be in the pictures to him. And I had to do that. I had to visualize it as I wrote. Because there was going to be so little actual writing in the book, so few words. Now, he also told me that if you're putting in speech balloons, try to have no more than two speech balloons in any one panel. For one thing, it takes up too much room. There's no picture. And for another, it makes people read too fast. So you can see here, I've gone with one speech balloon in each panel. 
that slows down the pace of the story so you can enjoy the pictures. Well, I started out writing the book with a notebook and I split each page into six boxes. I'm such a messy writer that Josh suggested that instead I write the script for the graphic novel to look like this. So on each page I've split it up into six sections and I've used different fonts on my computer for when people are talking and for my suggestions for what the picture will show. Now Josh could change his mind about the pictures and about the number of panels but this gets us started. Then Josh would start drawing. I'd send him a chapter at a time. First he did characters, then he did research. What did kids look like in 1933? What did the city look like in 1933? What did Kensington look like in 1933? He had a lot of work to do. Then, like Ruth, he drew rough copies. He, did, he worked straight to computer. I got to see these and make suggestions. Then he inked them in and he put in colors and we ended up with something very much like that. Okay, now how can you use this in the classroom? Well, again, storyboards. This time I suggest you take an eight panel storyboard and create a graphic that tells a short episode that could be in the story. Now in the book I said that Sid and his friends are trying to help their, monies by, help, their, help their families by making money. One of the things they do is they go to the old Sunnyside Amusement Park and they try busking. They try entertaining on the boardwalk for coins that are thrown into a cap. As this happens, they're interrupted by the cops, the money gets scattered and they lose practically all of it. Well, I thought, how about a variation on that? So, instead of that, here's the suggestion that I give to students. Use an eight panel storyboard and as a group you brainstorm this plot alternative. As they're busking, a dog runs by and makes off with the cap full of money. Sid and Plug and Rosie have to chase it through the crowds and the rides. What kind of mayhem happens? You can show that in pictures with not very much dialogue but lots of imagining. By panel eight, how could you have a happy ending? So again, I tried this. I've got a partial storyboard with a beginning and an ending and maybe it will come in handy. So I've got them in the first. Now notice I've drawn pictures, kind of, in this as well because I want to see how it would all fit together. And I've used dialogue. So here they are singing at the beginning. They're singing Bill Bailey and there's coins kind of being tossed into kind of a cap. The dog makes off of it. And I've got two speech balloons. The dog, it's got the cap. Catch him. I haven't drawn in the characters yet. I'm a slow drawer and not a good one. Again, I don't have the middle of the story, but I do have a suggestion in the, for the ending that you could keep in your back pocket. Um, they're going to catch the dog eventually. The money's gone. But somebody has to own that dog, I think. You found my dog. Here's a reward for your trouble. So, you can tell a chunk of story in eight panels. You can do the illustrations. This is rough copy, but you can do the illustrations and ink it and color it and you've got a cool graphic novel page. Now, there's a quick peek at writing for illustration in graphic novels and picture books and a couple of suggestions about how you can use my books and these techniques for your classrooms. I hope you try these. I hope you have fun with these activities and I really do hope you have fun with the two books. Um, they're a pretty good read if I do say so myself. Now you can find more about them by searching Scholastic Canada's pages on the books. Uh, there's readings there, there's video, there's activity downloads. You just type in Scholastic Canada and the titles. Friends for Real and The Good Fight. You can find out more about me at my website uh, tedstauntonbooks.com uh, I'd be happy to talk about workshops with you or offer advice or any suggestions I can. I'm sorry that we couldn't get together at reading for the love of it, but thanks for watching and happy reading. Thank you so much, Ted and Ruth. Those were wonderful presentations. I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us today and to thank Scholastic Canada, both for publishing these amazing books and for offering a prize pack of the books that we presented today to a lucky winner. I hope that you'll join us for a future webinar, but until then, 
please remember to continue reading for the love of it. Bye for now.